I'm Kelly Lemon. And I'm Michael Paul Williams. And welcome to the After the Monuments podcast, where we look at events and news about race in a historical context and see how, too often, history repeats itself. In this episode, we're talking with Anjali Moon and Cisha Moon of the Jackson Project. And, of course, our topic of this episode, um, it puts us back before the monuments even went up, but it takes us well through today. And what exactly is the American story, Michael Paul? And, like, how are we even telling parts of it? Do you want to start us off? Yeah, we, um, we are learning. Part of this moment that we're in is we are learning excavating more and more about our history than even those of us who have a tremendous interest in it thought we knew. And, and, and part of that narrative involves Jackson Ward, yeah. um, a local treasure of ours that, um, thanks to our guest here, we are learning more and more about each day. Yeah. And the more we learn about the past of Jackson Ward, the more resonance it has for what direction Richmond should be going in in its future. Yeah. So, um, Cisha and Anjali um, have lifted up, lifted us up with this project, um, the Jackson Project, that is telling us more than we ever, <laughs> telling us everything we thought we didn't know or didn't need to know. It, it's just been a blessing. Yeah. Let's welcome them um, to this podcast. Um, they are dear friends of mine, and uh, Michael Paul, you have worked closely with them on this project and some other things. So, um, welcome, Moon Sisters. Hello. Greetings. Thanks for having us. How are y'all doing? We are great and just excited to have you all on as our first guest for our very first podcast um, here. And um, one, what I want you all to do is tell us exactly what the Jackson Project is. And, you know, while you're doing that, you know, how both of your careers and your roles have landed you to this important work. Mm -hmm. You want to open that up, Cecil? Um, well, sure. The Jackson Project is a reparative um, historic preservation nonprofit. We are really dedicated to helping to unearth the undertold stories of Black Richmond, um, and that landed us with a particular focus on Jackson Ward as the country's first historically registered Black urban neighborhood. Um, you know, I think Anjali can kind of get into this, but it's not a project that we set out to do. Um, she'll give you some more background <laughs> about how this led her to asking me to do some research on uh, Jackson Ward. But I think my background, and not even my background, my upbringing, as well as my sisters, really prepared us for this work. I mean, we're raised by two Black people from Richmond, mm -hmm. Virginia, uh, by way of Blackwell and Bird Park. We grew up in Bird Park. Um, we went to a school where like, when you think about the statues and the schools and the street names, they kind of just fade to black, not even really recognizing uh, who the names really represent. Mm -hmm. um, but for myself, in addition to just that upbringing, you know, I, I have a bachelor's and a master's in black studies from VCU. I went on to get a PhD in public policy and urban planning from um, Old Dominion University, who knew that that urban planning PhD would come full circle through this work. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've, you know, if you know me, you know, I've always been, our father's name is August Moon. Some people know him um, in the city, some, you know, and <laughs> I feel like that has been foundational in who I am, even down to, uh, you know, being a Delta and being the president of Black Caucus at VCU. I think at times Kelly had to get me out of trouble. Uh, <laughs> I did. I was always, <laughs> <laughs> I, did. Yeah. I was always, I was always trying to challenge systems. Um, and mm. now that has led me to being a chief diversity officer in the federal government. And so um, I think when we look back at our life, we've always kind of been um, being prepped and primed to do this work, yeah. whether we knew it or not. And so maybe that will explain why Angela even asked me to pull a fact in the first place. And Cisha, do me a favor. Can you spell out your name? Because one of the things that I've been noticing is that when people want to know more about somebody, um, they want to Google them, right? They want to get your receipt, see if you really got credit, right? So spell out your name if people want to know how to Google you and find you. Okay, well, I'm very specific about my name. is Cisha Joy Moon. So S-E-S-H-A-J-O-I, which is in homage to our grandparents, and Moon, M-O-O-N, like in the sky. Great, thank you. And Anjali, before you start, can you do the same thing? I sure can. I am Anjali Moon. That's E-N-J-O-L-I, last name Moon, like in the sky. Um, yeah. 
I'm, my middle name is Jadon. If you want to look it up, J A U G O N, <laughs> I know uh, that's and right. that is a family name. I know that's right. Tell us about uh, same thing, the same way that uh, Cisha came in. Tell us about you. Yeah, so uh, you know, as Cisha said, I think um, our upbringing really helped to prepare us for this work uh, in a really organic way. Um, our <laughs> father was really active in the Richmond scene, especially like that. Uh, political scene sometimes in that activism space. And so we were able to see someone kind of go out uh, boots on the grounds a lot of times just to see what it meant to engage. And I think we just kind of soaked that in and it helped to inform the way in which we see the world and the lens through which we see it and approach it. Uh, for me, I don't have all those letters behind my name. I, I took a different path. Um, well, I don't have the student loan, so yeah. Well, I do have the student loan, <laughs> okay. Uh, but I, you know, I study sociology uh, at, at VCU. Uh, but actually, um, my connectivity to this project uh, is really interesting in that it's, it's kind of direct in certain ways. Uh, when I turned 20, I started working at a place called The Croker Spot, uh, which is a restaurant uh, owned and operated by uh, Never Eggleston III, a part of the Eggleston uh, legacy and lineage. That's a 100-year legacy out of Jackson Ward. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of came into my own as an adult, as a young woman, and just what it meant to be an entrepreneur under the tutelage of that family. Yeah. And so to be able to come full circle with a project like the Jackson Project that's focusing on the histories of Jackson Ward and understanding the shoulders that we're standing on, uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, as far as the work that I do, once I left Croker Spot, um, I moved on to do something, uh, not at all in that space. <laughs> uh, I started a film festival called the Africana Independent Film Festival the founder creative director of that. I'm also the assistant curator of film and special programs at the Institute for Contemporary Art here in Richmond. Yeah. Uh, I do a couple of other things. I uh, started something called Give Black Richmond, which is a philanthropic space. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you know, I've just been- BLK RBA. BLK RBA, <laughs> founding chair, BLK RBA. Um, you know, I'm, I feel blessed to have stayed in Richmond and been around at a time that Richmond began to kind of grow into itself. Yeah. And, you know, alongside you, Kelly, um, and some other creatives really kind of pouring into a bucket that helped to shape the city that we're becoming. Uh, and so to be able to take that acumen from that Black creative and social space and pour it into a project like Jackson, the way that we show up means a lot to me. Yeah. Talk about, um, and Michael Paul, please jump in because, yeah. you know, I can I can go. But. Yeah. Um, Anjali or, or Cisha, um Tell us, tell our national audience mm -hmm. about Jackson Ward. We, I think everyone's um, aware of Greenwood in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and its legacy as a black Wall Street. Uh, we also have Durham, North Carolina, with its um, legacy as a black Wall Street. There are communities that came out of emancipation all around the country that, that had that, that history where um, black people who had once been enslaved almost immediately became serious entrepreneurs in, in prosperous communities, and none more so than Jackson Ward. So tell us uh, about um, Jackson Ward, uh, a national historic landmark, and, 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 and how it stands um, next to those other black Wall Streets. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think we can kind of tag team this you know, I'll say, as you say, it's a landmark. It is actually the first federally designated urban historic uh, black neighborhood in the country, right? And Richmond, Jackson Ward, like Richmond, like a lot of spaces in Virginia, don't necessarily get its just due in terms of its history and its impact and its role in the American narrative and especially the black national narrative. Uh, Jackson Ward was indeed one of the uh, famous Wall Streets, Black Wall Streets in the United States. Uh, and for us, for most people who do know about Jackson Ward, it's really, that's the entry point uh, that most people learn about Jackson Ward in that late 1800s, early 1900s. People who know about Maggie Walker, who was the first Black woman to charter a bank in the United States. Uh, the, the quality row, the beautiful homes, the architecture, uh, and just the amazing amount of entrepreneurship that burgeoned in this space uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, and, but what we learned through the Jackson Project, and I'm sure we'll get a little bit more into this later, is that it started long before that, right? So what we need to know is that any Wall Street, and I'm sure this is, is probably true for the other Wall Streets in the country, but Jackson Wall for sure, did not happen out of a vacuum. Right, there is a, a legacy of entrepreneurship that dates back to the 1700s 
uh, carrying us into the 1900s. And so as we got to the 1900s, people had examples of what it meant to uh, be autonomous uh, in the way in which you stand up in the entrepreneurial space and how you utilize that power and leverage it uh, for socio and political gain. Uh, and that is why <laughs> Jackson Ward became one of the most uh, prominent and celebrated uh, Black spaces along the East Coast. And even if uh, America, uh, maybe as a, as, a, as a whole, doesn't understand it, I think that Black America um, has a little bit of an understanding and they're growing in their interest in learning more and more about Jackson Ward. Indeed. Uh, Maggie Walker, um, first African-American um, woman, uh, Charter Bank. Um, William Washington Brown, first Black yeah. person, period, to, to Charter, Charter Bank, Bank in, 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 okay. in America. Um, and man who seems like he was pretty much right up there with say, Booker T. Washington among the um, early nationally prominent uh, black leaders. Um, uh, tell us about Jackson Ward now, if you could. And why well, the Jackson Project even, you know, came to be. Well, I guess Anjali will have to tell you how it came to be, and then I'll chime in on... But now, so I'll, I'll speak a little bit to how it came to be and just speak a little bit on the now. So how it came to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I mentioned, I have a film festival called Africana in 2020. Uh, Africana turned five. But of course, we know what 2020 brought in uh, uh, Corona. Right. And so like everywhere on the globe, we were trying to figure out how do we show up and connect with community uh, even though we had to pivot to a virtual space uh, in order to keep people safe. So one of the things I wanted to do uh, was do projections in different neighborhoods across Richmond. And in each of those neighborhoods, I wanted to pair them with 10 black facts uh, from each neighborhood. And so I reached out to Cisha. Uh, we, she and I also have something that we do called black ass field trips. <laughs> and we do uh, black facts associated with that field trip. Uh, and so she's a researcher, PhD, like, hey, can you find 10 black facts for each of these neighborhoods for me? Thinking it's going to be a light lift. She says yes, and we'll get into <laughs> how the, the Pandora box that that has opened that led to uh, the Jackson Project. Yeah. Um, but that's that's really the seed that was planted that started the Jackson Project. Yeah. Um, and as you ask, you know, what is Jackson Ward like now? I even though we didn't set out to create this project, you know, we do acknowledge that this is something that was ancestrally led. And we think that it's an interesting time to have a project focused on Jackson Ward. Yes, because of the evolution of the city of Richmond, but also because of the evolution of Jackson Ward itself. You know, we, we just finished talking about uh, Black Wall Street and this it's this rich, prominent Black neighborhood. But if you were to look at Jackson Ward today, it doesn't really reflect that mm -hmm. outside of landmarkers. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's a space like many metropolitan spaces throughout the country that essentially has been gentrified. Right. The people who have traditionally lived there have been priced out uh, and it's hard for them to gain access and a foothold to get back in. And so, you know, we're at a place now where there's because of the highway and I'm sure we'll talk about that. There are two different sides of Jackson Ward. And so we have an opportunity potentially on another side of Jackson Ward that hasn't really been developed yet to take all of the information that we have acquired, all the lessons that we've learned and try to do right so that black people can can still live there and then not just be a part of history and legacy and memory. Yeah, I think for me, you know, I'm thinking about when you were mentioning Booker T. Washington and it made me think about, you know, what's the overarching goal of Jackson now that it's the world's longest sisterly favor turned nonprofit organization. <laughs> Um, what you call it course, again? The, the, the what? What did the you call it? The world's longest sisterly favor turned nonprofit. It's <laughs> not on me anymore. Okay. Yes. Anjali owes me so much. This was supposed to be a 10 minute task. Okay. <laughs> um, you got it. I, I think when I, when I think about the mission, yes, we have, you know, like I said, we're a reparative nonprofit, historic preservation for, you know, to drive restorative truth telling and redemptive uh, uh, storytelling. But the truth is this, 
our real mission is for people to put respect on Richmond's name. And I think I need to say again, yeah, because when you just brought up Booker T. Washington, it made me think about Giles B. Jackson and the fact that he tapped him to be one of his first executive officers for the Negro Business League. When we're dealing with COVID-19 right now, 100 years ago, Maggie Walker was tapped to help us navigate the 1918 influenza pandemic. And so when I look at Jackson Ward, I see a space of celebration, but I also see a cautionary tale in a lot of ways. Yeah. And so, you know, people respected us at one point because in addition to us being a black Wall Street, we were also a Harlem of the South. I mean, these acts, they came to Richmond. They stayed here. And before we were even those two names, we were a little Africa. We were a space of black excellence, black entrepreneurship and really the birthplace. I mean, you can't say that the first black woman to charter a bank and the first black man or the first black person, period, are from here. And we are not the birthplace. And so I think that that's that's what I want to see next for Jackson Ward is that yeah. we get our just due that dates back to well before Maggie Walker and also includes the shoulders in which she stood on with someone like Abraham Payton Skip with, which, you know, we'll get into later. Yeah, come on. Because uh, my- Michael Paul is over here just itching, ready to go, yeah, ready to go. Is, I mean, you, you brought up the highway and we all know what happened um, in Tulsa with Greenwood and, mm-hmm. and um, how that community was assaulted from above by bombs from airplanes and by um, um, a white populace that just was um, envious of the success of the community and and, and basically um, uh, uh, participated in in the most grievous uh, domestic uh, violence um, uh, of terrorism, act of terrorism in American history. Um, But in Virginia, we have a way of doing things that's kind of different. We don't, you know. So we we just we mm-hmm. just run highways through places. We don't have to bomb. We just kind of plot and then run a highway through a community, and that. Um, yeah, and if you, and if and for those that are listening in that have ever traveled on ninety five, coming from the south or coming from the north, um, right in the area, kind of. If I have to give you some reference points of where Jackson Ward was kind of just ripped through, um, think about where our ballpark is until you see kind of the Richmond sign, VCU Health. If I, if I had to give you landmarks, Virginia Union may be like the starting point middle ground once you see that sign. Yeah. So, yeah, but- and, and just to say, it, it, it even stretches beyond that when we think about the historical footprint of Jackson Ward. You know, so we have the historic footprint that kind of cuts off now around that Third Street corridor. But we think about the historical stretch that takes us all the way down to the train station. Right. Mm. And so when we think about what was really impacted, really destroyed, we need to think a little bit broader, you know, over time that that space shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. But initially, when we're thinking about uh, this Harlem of the South, this little Africa, when we're thinking about this space where black entrepreneurship is at its height and we have black people understanding their economic, political and social power. This is spread all the way down to our train station. So it was a much larger footprint than what we know now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and as you said, uh, Michael Paul, you know, Tulsa might have been uh, destroyed through bombs and, and, and aircrafts, but here we deal it through policy mm-hmm. and bond yep. referendums, yep. Yep. right? And, and it was equally as impactful uh, and it has sustained itself all the way here to 2022. Yep. And, and can I say, we also do it through political dis, you know, redistricting. I mean, I know that's policy, but it's important to recognize like the origin story of Jackson Ward. You know, like that's one of the things we recovered, that it extended all the way down to 18th Street. We were able to pinpoint the day in which the neighborhood got its name, April 17th, 1871, because well before we needed to rip a highway through this community to disrupt intergenerational wealth and Black families and, you know, Black businesses, they actually gerrymandered this space because there was too much Black autonomy, Mm -hmm. Black political prowess happening in the 1870-1871 time period during Reconstruction. And so it's interesting, like, I can't speak for Anjali, but I know the, the historian in me now, <laughs> when I look, when I literally walk through Jackson Ward, I, I think you're asking, like, what do I see in present day? But I, like, envision its past. And its past that really does go back to the original assaults um, well before 19, the 1950s with the Richard Petersburg Turnpike. Um, the Virginia Way has done a number on Jackson Ward at several different iterations, and I think that that's, uh, you know, pretty hidden history. 
Yeah. But, and which is why it's hidden history. Yeah. But part of a national playbook um, that, lives, yep. that lives with us yep. to this day, yep. gerrymandering. I mean, gerrymandering is going on at a fever pitch nationally as we speak. And public policy is still destroying um, African-American neighborhoods. Real quick, After the Monuments is proud to thank Team Henry Enterprises for their support of our show. Team Henry Enterprises is a black-owned contracting firm specializing in office, retail, medical, multifamily, and higher education construction of all scopes and sizes. In the wake of the George Floyd protest, Team Henry is the very firm contracted by the city of Richmond to take down the Confederate monuments in Richmond and by many other municipalities to remove other Confederate monuments around Virginia and throughout the Southeast. Learn more about Team Henry and how they can help your community rebuild, renovate, or design at TeamHenryENT.com. The Jackson Ward story is an age-old story, um, and, and, and you use the word um, reparative um, to describe the work that the Jackson Project's doing. There's a lot of need for repair, and per perhaps you're thinking this could be a template uh, for other oh, communities we, that have been similarly assaulted? Yes. I mean, we see this as a having the potential to be a model. I mean, as you said, you know, at the end of the day, Jackson Ward is a microcosm for a much larger storyline that's played, it's played itself out all the way across the nation. Uh, these infrastructure projects uh, have gone through and destroyed a number of uh, thriving communities, Jackson Ward just being one. And so as we begin to navigate what it means to be reparative, you know, that we're, we're just one piece of a puzzle. You know, this it has to be a holistic approach, right? We're talking about people, we're talking about families that were destroyed, we're talking about generational wealth that was raped and raped from, from people. And so what does it mean to actually try to make that whole is a much larger conversation. Uh, we think that bringing uh, this history that we've been able to excavate um, and give some level of elevation to is just one piece of it. Uh, but we're trying to figure it out, but we do think that this aspect of it can be a model and what it means for people from their community to do research about their community and then put some level of energy behind what it means to make people whole in some way. And, and if I can piggyback, I think, you know, when we talk to other people, cause we're starting to have this national conversation through Jackson and it's like, well, who is your Jackson? Cause we all mm -hmm. have them. And it's more than one Jackson in Richmond. Jackson mm -hmm. Ward isn't the only Jackson. Mm -hmm. And so when we were thinking about um, what does our nonprofit really look like, we developed eight pillars and uh, we have everything from like public art and programming to public policy and philanthropy and public engagement. But in addition to preservation and proprietorship, one of our key pillars is pedagogy. You know, like sometimes people reach out to Jackson Project and they think that we knew all of these things and now we're just getting to the point where we're sharing them. But mm -hmm. the truth is, no, we are learning this along In real time. by the city. Yeah. Um, growing up, we never even would have thought to think who is Jackson. You know, I mean, it's just really when I say those statues and streets and schools fade to black, I just found out that the elementary school I went to is named after Confederate soldier maybe uh, three years ago. Um, it's just certain questions that we just never asked ourselves or never had access to really be able to find the answers. Okay. And so, Cisha, before you get deep, talk about that access because, I mean, because of the RTD's history, we were able to, like, kind of open up the doors for you and give you access to things. I mean, it was right there in the paper. It was it was right there for you to find. So did the Valentine. And, and what else... Did you find that you were like, whoa, that's too much for right now? <laughs> yeah, you know, our, our first inquiry started with Michael Paul and Black History Museum. They were our first two uh, points of, and, and I'd say foot, uh, <laughs> never Eccleston. Yeah. Those were the three people that we reached out to first say, hey, who is Jackson? Mm. <laughs> and Bill. And, oh, and Bill. Yep, At the Valentine Bill. Museum. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then that led to coming to the RTD, digging in the archives. That led to going to Library of Virginia and meeting folks like Greg Kimball, who helped me figure out literally how to try to find these answers. Um, and also Valentine Museum, as mentioned. And I think that when we think about like that access point, it's been super important with the resources around us, but I will name a void in the access is that even when looking at the RTD, it's still it's still through the lens of whiteness in the 1950s or the 
1800s or whatever, 1900s, whatever the time period is that we're looking at. What we have found, um, you know, even with trying to work with institutions like an Afro-American um, who was the boots on the ground paper at the time for the black lens, um, it's, that's a that's a void that we need to fill to to help them digitize their archives so that we can also take a deeper dive in understanding how black people were resisting what black people's perspectives were and so and, and we've been in contact with them and their archivist has been fantastic in helping us uh, you know try to piece this together mm -hmm. but yeah rtd was one of the first and i know that that was a gutsy move because what was reported wasn't always um well, so politically correct in how it was being reporting which was also great right to be in a time when people didn't have to mince their words mm -hmm. and so when you're dealing with people who are creating narratives who think they're talking about a people who will never be empowered and that they have they owe nothing to uh they're speaking freely look we are trying to keep these this out of the hands of the enemy as they say Literally. black people being the enemy Th these are the words that they're saying and so to be able to kind of revisit uh, some of those articles and understand exactly the way people were thinking, how people were feeling, and them having uh, no fear in terms of articulating that. It was very helpful in this research, as Tisha said, you know, trying to figure out what was the landscape that made them want to even gerrymander a space. They told us straight up. <laughs> they, they didn't cloak it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tisha mentioned earlier the, the Valentine. That's the Valentine Museum, the, uh, the, the Museum of Richmond History. That's its specialty. Um, when you when you speak of um, the Times Dispatch, um, I, I think back to the day that Cisha reached out um, to me, saying she wanted to visit our archives, um, and part of what she was seeking was the answer to one critical question: Who is Jackson? Can you <laughs> can you go into that? Because um, I'm sure people are wondering, well, who is this Jackson fellow that they're, they're talking about? That, and what's that, the story? That you put an X on. <laughs> you put a whole X on. That you put a whole, a whole X project on. project named and, after. Yeah, explain that, too, um, in terms of, you know, the X within your name. <clears throat> uh, so I'll tackle who is Jackson, and I'll let Lee talk about the X. So, you know, yes, you are correct. Reached out again. Yeah. Who, are ja who are Jackson, more specifically? There you go. There it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know... We started this, you know, first, before we even reached out to anyone, we thought it was going to be a Google search, okay? You know what I mean? Because we were just in the day and age, Google's supposed to answer everything. Google helped to then help us recognize that this has been a point of contention since around 1902. Um, there are up to five different Jacksons generally associated with the name. Uh, a lot of people don't know, including myself. I did not know that Richmond operated by a ward system because, you know, even though Jackson Ward had its name, you know, we, we from sides and ends around here. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but in the early 1800s, it was a uh, award system was introduced to the city. Um, and a lot of those original wards, like a Clay and Jefferson, were named after either presidents or notable statesmen. And so there was a, a rumor that it was named after Andrew. Second was a conflation of two different men, um, a Joseph Jackson and a James Jackson. But at the time of doing the research, we were told that it was James Jackson of a beer garden. And so we were able to like uh, separate, parse that out. There was a Joseph Jackson and he owned a pleasure garden, which is a little bit different because beer gardens didn't really start to emerge until the mid 1800s versus Joseph Garden had a pleasure garden in the early 1800s. And their functionality was, you know, significantly different. A pleasure garden was more so for entertainment versus a beer garden was more so, you know, centered around drinking. Um, so that's that. We think that people might have thought it was a beer garden, though, because what people also did not know, including myself, was that in addition to Black residents, some of the early settlers in what would become Jackson Ward were a lot of immigrants of German descent. Um, another was that they thought that Joseph was Black. And we think that that might have been because, you know, that famous picture of the 1904-05 uh, Emancipation Day Parade on Broad Street, um, you know, when they would hold those Emancipation Day parades, they would actually start in front of his beer garden as the parade route. Pleasure garden. So, uh, pleasure garden, mm -hmm. sorry. And so maybe people just assumed that maybe he was Black, not sure. But the Black Jackson was James Jackson, and he was actually one of the first Black pharmacists in the city of Richmond. Um, and his daughter would actually be Alice Jackson, who would go to UVA and then challenge um, the you know admission of Black students, led to the Duval Act, and then you have Black kids having to go out of school to get educated for well over 20 years. Go out of state. Yeah. Go out of state, yeah. And so that led us to that. 
And we were able to like check those off the list. So then that led us to Giles B. Jackson, you know, who Anjali- That's who I thought it was. That's who mm-hmm. she thought it was. Um, I mean, cause he, he's the first black man to be barred in the, in the uh, state. He goes on to, you know, do the Jamestown Tercentennial. He does a black anthology. Um, you know, he- Now, when you say barred, he was, he was lawyer. Yes, he was a lawyer, first black lawyer. Mm-hmm. Um, and but when you look at the chronological timelines, um, we were able to sit that one down too because of when he was born, when he came, uh, uh, you know, was no longer enslaved versus when Jackson Ward was established. So that led us to now having to understand more about the Jerry. Once we understood the origin date and that was a gerrymander political district, we were like, okay, well, what would cause you to want to gerrymander something? And so that led us to, you know, taking a deeper dive on understanding more about urbanized enslavement, which I knew very little about. Ex- explain that just for a quick hit, uh, Cisha, what that is, because you blew me with that one. Okay, okay urbanized Mm. Or urbanized enslavement, you know, it's only a few cities that have it. It's us, it's Baltimore, it's New Orleans, it's Charleston. You have the industrial wave coming in, late 1700s, early 1800s. What that does is that you have enslaved people moving from plantations in the counties, uh, migrating into city centers and working in places like a Tredegar Ironworks. Um, but what that does is two things. One, once you are able to pay off your brokered amount uh, between your broker and your enslaver, sometimes enslaved Black people are able to save the additional money. Um, and then what it also did was once you were done working at the plant for a day, you could also get, you know, do a side hustle. Anjali says it's like the birth of the side hustle. Here. Really? So that's why you have those eating houses popping up, those grog shops, those laundry mats, uh, those shoe shine or shoe parlors. Um, and so that is why in 1852, the city directory has almost 400 freed black people who are actually homeowners oh, in the city well before Emancipation Proclamation because they're able to manumit themselves. Um, and so I say all that to say, once we understood that, we understood 1870, we understood the height of reconstruction, the constitutional convention in the city, we understand that union occupation is coming to an end um, because the ex-Confederate soldiers are jockeying for the city back. And Richmond is literally a mess in 1870. Um, mm. That helped us understand that Richmond wasn't the only one. Like when we talk about that that plain language they were using then, uh, at this time, they make it clear that in the north to Richmond and Richmond County, they are going to rename their townships and include one of them named the Stonewall Township. Richmond does Jackson Ward. And then the following day in Manchester, which isn't annexed yet, they say quite literally, we need to prevent our space from falling into the hands of the enemy. And we recommend redistricting and adding a Lee and Jackson district as well and so mm. that helped to you leave know, for un- robert e lee correct yes correct and so that helped to crack the code you know on you know this was happening across the state um at the height of reconstruction you know we think about that law lo- that lost cause and we really say that narrative is like the late 1800s early 1900s the truth is that it really started a little bit earlier than that they were starting to lay the uh foundations um with things like naming something like a Jackson Ward. But I'll let Anjali explain why we have an X because, you know, you yeah. can't let the first historically black urban neighborhood in the country be named after Stonewall Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, it, you know, it, it's still uh, on paper is, you know, Jackson Ward, right? Uh, as we have traditionally known it. But as we decided to move forward and this became, you know, quite organically its own thing, a project. Uh, we wanted to name it. We wanted to pay homage to the information that we were uncovering, mm-hmm. right? And so in order to do that, uh, we we could continue to say Jackson, let that be Giles B. Jackson. But what we know is that uh, when you say X, right, when we think of Malcolm X, this is a level of autonomy that he was exercising and saying, listen, you know, I'm still discovering, right? And this is a project, this mm. is a project focused on discovery. Yeah. And so as we think about what it means to discover Jackson Ward, to uh, define Jackson Ward based on its history, but also lay some groundwork to define its future, uh, that X kind of marks the spot in that regard as we think about, yes, the naming convention, but we also think about the energy around Jackson Ward. And so that's what the X signifies for us. You're listening to Real Talk About Race, After the Monuments, Real Talk About Race, it's uh, Michael Paul Williams and Kelly Lemon. We are on with the Moon Sisters. And, um, you know, I feel like I learned so much 
I, I've heard all of this, but I feel like every time I hear y'all talk, I learn something else. And I think, like you just said, um, Anjali, that's the discovering part of this. Um, and I want to kind of tie it back to the theme for tonight is about, you know, our place in American history. You've been listening to After the Monuments, real talk about race with Kelly Lemon and Michael Paul Williams. We'll be back next week with more from the Moon Sisters to learn more about their discovery phase and Michael Paul's writings on the project, including a man named Abraham Skipwith. And not only his lasting contributions to Jackson Ward, but also to black and white Americans alike, while being considered an enslaved man in Richmond. We'll be back next week. After the Monuments is a Virginia Video Network production and produced by Matt Pacilli, Michael Paul Williams, and me, Kelly Lemon. Technical direction and editing from Bill Barksdale. Executive production from Paul Farrell, Diane Salvatore, and Paige Mudd. Will Royer provides studio support. Our artwork is by Krishna Mathis. I'm Kelly Lemon, and we'll see you next week on After the Monument.